Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Um, thank you, first of all, to everyone for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we love to continue the Meetup Live series here today. So first of all, just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Josh Rowland. I'm a client success manager here at Meetup. Um, today's event is featuring Norina Hertz. Uh, she's a Meetup organizer and author of The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart. She's here to share her research on loneliness, including its effects on health, wealth, and democracy. And she's going to talk to us about how to beat loneliness by building authentic communities, both online and in person. So I'm so excited for that. Um, before we get started, we're going to go over some guidelines and also an agenda. So um, thank you for switching the slide there. So uh, this event will be recorded, first of all. Uh, but don't worry, your video is not on and your audio is muted as well. So you'll only hear Norina and myself today. You are not being recorded. Um, the chat for the event will be turned off, but if you have any questions, please submit them at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So just click that Q&A button if you wanna ask a question. We'll go over those questions at the end of the event. We also have closed captioning available today. So on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a live transcription icon. You can select your preference for closed captioning. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so just the agenda for today's event, we'll be doing a brief introduction first, then we're going to have a discussion with Norina, and then we'll answer some of your questions in the last 15 minutes of the event. Uh, so let me go on right now and just introduce Norina uh, Norina Hertz, we are so excited to have you. She is a renowned thought leader, academic, and broadcaster, named by the Observer as one of the world's leading thinkers and by Vogue as one of the world's most inspiring women. Her previous bestsellers, The Silent Takeover, The Debt Threat, and Eyes Wide Open, have been published in more than 20 countries, and her opinion pieces have appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, the Guardian and Financial Times. She's hosted her own show on Sirius XM and she's spoken at TED, the World Economic Forum in Davos and Google Zeitgeist. Hertz holds an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD from Cambridge University. And she's based at University College London where she holds an honorary professorship. Um, so it's just so amazing to have you here, Norina Hertz. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And it's so wonderful to see all these names from all across the world, from as far as field as Australia, South Africa, the United States, Canada, the UK, I mean, it, Germany, it's, it's really inspiring. So hi, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Yeah, truly incredible. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, okay, so I have a bunch of questions for you today, Norina, uh, really trying to learn a lot about this. But I want to start off just asking the basic question, which is what made you write this book about loneliness? So, um, so a few reasons, but I'll, I'll single out two perhaps. The first was I was teaching at university. I'd been teaching at university for you know, quite a long time. And about three years ago, I started noticing something different. More and more students were coming into my office and in office hours, they were confiding in me and telling me how lonely they felt. And this, this was quite a new phenomenon. So I kind of noted it uh, at the same time. And also we don't really typically think of loneliness as being something that affects young people. You know, we typically think of it as being something that affects older people. So it kind of registered with me and I thought, okay, this is interesting. Is something going on here? Um, and then another reason was I had bought an Alexa and I'm very sorry if, you have an Alexa and it's gonna go off now. But I bought an Alexa and I realized that I was becoming increasingly attached to my Alexa. Um, you know, I'd kind of sometimes go, hi Alexa, tell me a joke or, um, or you know, have, have a little chat with her, so to speak. And um, it's amazing how I do think of her as a her. Um, and it got me thinking about the fact that a whole economy was really emerging, what I've now called the loneliness economy, designed really to meet that need people have 
that fundamental need for connection and um, friendship and at best community. And, and it got me thinking about, well, the market is speaking here. There's clearly this big demand for um, such products, which again suggests that something's going on. And as I dug more and more into the research and started interviewing lots of people and looked at all the scientific research, I came to realize that loneliness was you know, in many ways the defining condition of the 21st century. In the United States, one in five people, even before the pandemic, said that they were lonely always or often. Um, one in five millennials said that they didn't have a single friend at all. Uh, in American nursing homes, 60% of um, people who live there, retirees who live there, say that they never get a, a single visitor. So I was looking at all this data, 40% of people feel lonely at work. And I realized that loneliness was a really huge problem affecting you know, people around us, um, if, not our, if not ourselves, but many of us too. And yet it was something that wasn't really being discussed and the reasons for it weren't being interrogated and explored, let alone the solutions. And there are many solutions, which is the good news. And so you looked at that research and you started to explore. And I know you found stories from all around the world. Uh, some, some things like robots flipping burgers and people paying to be cuddled. Somehow that all has to do with loneliness. So can you tell us a little more about those specific stories you found in your research? Sure. So, um, well, at the extreme, um, some people are so lonely that they're paying to be cuddled. And uh, I actually went and tried out in the name of research. I went to a place called the Cuddle Sanctuary in Venice Beach. And you, it's basically like a meetup group, except you're going to be cuddled. And um, you're paying to be cuddled. And you're paying to be cuddled and cuddle each other in a consensual way, in a non-sexual way. And it really kind of speaks to, um, something quite sad that's going on in our society that people are so starved of intimacy that they are uh, having to find it and, and even pay for it. Um, that's of course an extreme example, but, um, but I also, uh, I met in my journeys other, I came across other instances of contemporary loneliness. One surprising one is, yes, you referenced Flippy. Flippy is the burger flipping chef who I encountered in California as well, actually. And he's a really good chef. Like he always uses the correct spatula. He always flips his burgers perfectly, never asks for time off, never needs a vacation. Um, so in many ways, he's the perfect employee. And over the next 20 years, it's projected that 40% of jobs are going to go to robots, not only these kind of jobs, which got me thinking and writing and exploring in the book about what will it feel like when your colleague, your coworker is a robot? And how lonely will, will it also feel to you, to any of us, if we feel that actually we're competing for a job with a robot. And nowadays, you know, robots, are, it's not just lower skilled jobs that robots are taking over there. Um, we see robots taking over paralegal work and even lawyer hour work, robots taking over accountancy work, even robots taking over the services of priests. In fact, um, there's a robot priest in Germany um, who, was so popular that the Pope actually said, you know, don't be confused. You still need to go to see a human priest. So, um, yeah, so I guess with my book, what I did was I kind of really looked at how loneliness is affecting us now, 
but also try to look into the future and imagine where we could be heading so that we can think about what we can do about it. Yeah, I think that forward looking approach is so important so we can address things before they happen. Uh, so how big a problem did you find when you started researching this? Uh, can you tell us something about the scope of what you found? So, um, so as I said, it's really um, widespread. And what was also clear from my research was that it's affecting all of us, um, young, old, rich, poor, male, female. Um, what, we, what we also know from the research is that the pandemic has unsurprisingly really ramped up levels of loneliness. Uh, in the most recent US survey data, around 50% of Americans are currently feeling lonely. And this is actually, these are similar figures across the world at the moment. And what's interesting, but also of course concerning is that three groups are disproportionately lonelier. So everyone on average has become lonelier through the pandemic, but um, three groups have become especially lonely, women, um, young people, so the young already were the loneliest generation, but they've become lonelier still, and also um, people on low incomes and the unemployed. And, you know, which raises kind of big questions about how, um, how we help people come together and recognize that it isn't necessarily a one size, a one size fits all solution and that some of the drivers are inevitably structural um, as well, and they need to be addressed as well. Yeah, you're, you're starting to hint at this a little bit, but I'd love to hear more about just like how exactly uh, loneliness affects us, especially given our different ages and different incomes and uh, you know more of that breakdown about, about who's affected by it as well. Yeah, so um, affects all of us in, um, in a pretty similar way. So affects our mental health. Uh, that's perhaps not so surprising, but loneliness is clearly linked with increased levels of depression, increased links, levels of anxiety, and also at worst, unfortunately, increased rates of suicide. But what's less known is that loneliness also really affects our physical health. Um, in fact, loneliness is thought to be as bad for us as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And why this is, is because we are not designed to be lonely. We are essentially creatures of togetherness, hardwired to connect. And what happens is that when we feel, when we're in a state of loneliness, our body has evolved to really um, almost send an alarm through our system telling us this is not a desirable state go and do something about it so when we are lonely we have clear physiological response our blood pressure goes up our um, pulse rate goes up our levels of cortisol our stress levels in our body go up all of these really signaling to our body you know, don't be alone or you know in our kind of prehistoric selves go and find your tribe, um, go and find pe people to hunt and gather with. And the trouble is that in contemporary life, we don't do that. And so we remain in this state of loneliness for protracted periods. And being in this state of high alert, um, alarm bells ringing through our bodies, inevitably isn't good for us. And, you know, when witness why loneliness is so bad, equated with smoking 15 cigarettes a day, or in terms of life expectancy, um, making us as much as 30% more likely to die prematurely if we're lonely than if we're not. So um, really exacting a toll on us mentally and also physically. And the other area where loneliness is exacting a toll is actually when it comes to the economy. Because I mentioned before, 40% of office workers say that they're lonely at work. And yet we know from research that lonely workers are less motivated, less productive, um, less efficient, more likely to leave a company 
than workers who are not lonely. In fact, the single biggest determinant for whether someone will stay at a company is whether they have a friend at a company, um, a friend at their place of work. So loneliness is really bad for business. And yet loneliness is, you know, again, barely registers um, in boardrooms or, or in kind of, um, or in companies, in most companies. Yet addressing it would not only be good for the employees themselves, but also be good for business. Some really uh, a terrible detrimental effects you're outlining there. So I'm glad you're ringing the alarm bells about this. Um, so I, I wanted to ask and dig in a little more. You said that young people are the loneliest actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, so did you get any hints why are young people that lonely? Is, can we blame it all on social media or is there something else going on here? So, um, well, this kind of touches upon, you know, the bigger question of really why is this the lonely century? So maybe I'll, if that's okay, maybe I'll say a few words on that first because, and then, yeah. So, um, so why is yeah why is this the lonely century so i think there are a number of reasons at play the, the first is just simply we do less with other people than we did in the past so people are less likely to go to church they're less likely to be members of trade unions they're less likely to go to parent teacher associations for everyone who's involved in meetup you know we know the role that doing things with others um how that alleviates loneliness yet on in general the trend is people do less with others than in the past so that's definitely part of the reason um another part of the reason is that we've just become more individualistic over the past few decades you even see this in pop song lyrics which since the 1980s if you compare pop song lyrics in the 1980s or late 70s with pop song lyrics um, over the past decade, you see that words like we, us, and our have been steadily supplanted by words like I, me, myself. So we've become just much more I focused, much more me first. We've really come over the past few decades to recast ourselves um, as consumers rather than citizens, as hustlers rather than helpers, as takers rather than givers. And of course, a me-focused, me-first mindset is inevitably going to beget a lonelier, less connected um, environment and society. Um, the way we design our cities, cities increasingly designed for cars rather than people. Um, the scale of cities, meaning, I think you're in New York, aren't you, Josh, you were saying, and you know, I spent, I've spent a lot of time in New York, but any city, you know, you think people rushing by, nobody stopping to say hello, nobody looking at anyone else in the eye, headphone, headphones on, um, people hiding themselves in their digital privacy bubbles, all of these, again, kind of signaling to people, stay away. And of course, meaning that you feel less connected. The workplace, a lonely place, we've touched upon this. Um, we can come back to why that is later, but, uh, but why young people in particular and, and why all of us um, increasingly? Yeah, you mentioned, is it all about social media? Well, it's not all about social media, but it's definitely part of the problem. And, and I was pretty agnostic when I began my research on the subject of social media. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't begin my research you know, with a position on this, but having spent a few years really digging into the scientific research and also interviewing many, many teenagers, I came to realize that social media is playing a very fundamentally detrimental role when it comes to feeling connected um, to others or feeling isolated. In part, it's because of the quality of relationships um, on social media. I mean, you know, necessarily more superficial, necessarily curter. We know from research that, you know, the more stripped back a form of communication, the less empathy people feel towards each other. So 
so the the nature of the discourse the dialogue is necessarily um less empathetic you know we've all spent the past year we've, where we've been forced to migrate much of our relationships to text and social media and phones and zoom but you know especially to all of you kind of listening in i'm sure you all can't wait till you get back into physical um get togethers and meetups because the quality of those relationships um you know is is better uh but social media also playing a negative role for the fact that for many young people especially the level of abuse that they experience on social media is really significant. In the United Kingdom, 60% of UK college students have experienced abuse on social media. One in three women aged between 18 to 24 have been abused on Facebook. And of course, if you are being abused, if you are being bullied on a platform, that is going to make you feel more alone. There's also the fact that these media can be very excluding, especially for um, young people. One boy, Peter, he told me, a 14 year old schoolboy, he told me about what it was like, what it felt like when he would post on Instagram and then he'd be waiting, waiting, hoping for somebody to like his posts. And when they didn't, you know, berating himself and saying, what am I doing wrong? I'm feeling so alone. Or Claudia, the uh, 16 year old girl who told me that her friends had said that they weren't going out after school, but they did go out and she was scrolling on her feeds and she saw them having fun without her. She said, I felt so invisible. I just hid and so excluded. I hid in my room and um, wouldn't go to school for a week. And of course, kids always were excluded in the past, but the exclusion is so public nowadays, their exclusion is effectively broadcast. And also the adults in a child's life often isn't aware this is even going on. So whereas in the past, the teacher might have seen a kid not being asked to sit with them, or um, a parent might have seen their child not being invited to something because of so much of their social lives has migrated to these platforms, often the adult isn't even aware of it. And then uh, maybe a final reason to speak to is just the fact, and this is not only teenagers who will get, who get this feeling, it's very easy to believe that others are more popular than you when you scroll on your feeds and you just see, it seems like everyone else has got more likes, more retweets, more images of them having fun with people than you. And, 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 and it's partly also to do with the inauthenticity of much of what we post, that we post these kind of, um, filtered, perfected versions of ourselves on our feeds. You know, who posts on Facebook, stayed in, um, ate a packet of Mrs. Fields cookies and um, scrolled on Netflix. I mean, people tend not to do that. So again, it's easy to just feel like everyone else is more popular, um, got more friends. So those are just some of the reasons. And, and Scientifically, we know that from 2010, there was we've seen a real marked rise in loneliness levels amongst young people, really in lockstep with smartphone penetration amongst this age group and social media usage. But that could have been coincidental, it could have been correlation, but not, but without any causality. And yet, in 2019, Stanford University did a very important study where they had 1,500 students who used Facebook like usual and 1,500 who were told to stop using Facebook for two months. And then they kind of tracked how what happened to the group that stopped. And the group that stopped, interestingly, did considerably more in person with friends and family. So it wasn't that they just went and did other things online. No, just being off Facebook meant they did much more in person with friends and family. And they also felt significantly happier and significantly less lonely. And since then, there've been a number of studies that have replicated um, in experiments where basically people are charged with taking time out of social media and they, are, they feel considerably less lonely and typically considerably happier as well. Because also these devices are so, they're so addictive, these platforms. I mean, designed to be addictive. You know, I, 
when I was writing my book, I, I wasn't on them. But now that I'm out there in the world with my book, I am forced to be on them. And I even having written the book and knowing how addictive they are and knowing how they've been designed like slot machines to be addictive. You know, I feel myself reaching out for my phone to just check, you know, has anyone liked a post? And it's, you know, because it gives you that dopamine hit and, you know, and and we, we easily come to crave it. Yeah. Which is why I do, it's an area where I really do think governments should get involved and regulate better because it's very hard for us to um, regulate it ourselves like tobacco companies. Absolutely. I appreciate uh, just the rigorous uh, scientific research that seems to have gone into you thinking about this problem because it is so easy to demonize these things without uh, really doing that research, but to have the research beyond, behind it and to really see what's going on, uh, I think it's going to be so helpful for all of us. So great to hear about that. Um, you mentioned a while back uh, that we could dig into a little more why the workplace has been lonely for people. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'd just love to hear more about why that is. And I assume the problem predates even this prevalence of remote office work. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that as well. Yes, so yes, it definitely predates um, this past year. Uh, so one, surprising um, culprit turns out to be the open plan office, which is quite counterintuitive because you would think that open plan offices, everyone in a room together would make people feel more connected. But actually, it turns out the opposite holds true because, and I mean, I've worked in an open plan office. I don't know if you have, but I know that my way of being able to cope with the noise and everything was I would put my noise cancelling headphones on, would focus on my work, so, you know, which is a real sign to everyone around you, don't come and speak to me, stay away. Um, but also it's an environment in which you're constantly performing when you are speaking because you're really, you're, you're on a stage permanently. Everyone can kind of see you. So it doesn't really lead to authentic communication this panopticon space where everyone's watching each other and watching you. So I think that's another reason why it's so unconducive to connection. In fact, research was done by Harvard Business School where they um, tracked what happened to a company when they moved from offices uh, to an open plan format. And what they found was that people actually spoke far less to each other in person when they moved into that space and communicated far more by email or by messaging, even though they were in the same room. And then you've got hot desking, which is even worse. I mean, there was one poor woman I interviewed for my book, Carla, and she told me about how she had unfortunately had to have an operation. She had to take a month off work and it took her colleagues weeks to even notice she wasn't there because you know, when you're always moving from seat to seat, it's very easy for people to just simply not know whether you're in or not. Um, and of course, open plan offices, and this is really across the world, have increasingly become the norm in office space because it's much cheaper per employee, but you, know, you take up much less footprint. Remote work, of course, has... Um, created a whole host of problems for uh, many people. I think for many, um, the initial euphoria that was felt kind of a year back um, of, oh, this is quite fun and don't have to go into work is wearing pretty thin. And you know, many people are missing the um, office, even if it wasn't perfect, even if you didn't have so many friends there, they're realizing that actually those micro exchanges you might have at the water cooler or whilst you're wait, waiting for coffee to for the coffee to be ready actually make a huge difference to how connected we feel to each other so um so that's a whole kind of um creating a whole new layer of disconnection that companies are going to have to address um, another thing in the workplace that's interesting and the reason is that people eat together far less than in the past. In the past, people used to eat together and 
take their breaks at the same time as each other. That was pretty normal. And that really um, fell by the wayside um, some time back now. And, you know, nowadays, many of us typically would eat our desk, eat our lunch at our desk, our desco, um, on our own, maybe scrolling on our social media feeds. And, um, and actually, fascinating research done in Chicago with firefighters showed that those companies of firefighters who ate together not only felt significantly more bonded to each other, but performed twice as well as companies that didn't. So you know, something even as small as eating to, together can make a huge difference in how connected people feel to each other. So interesting. And I, I hope, uh, you know, I know some of my meetup colleagues are watching today, so I hope we'll think about this as we return back to the office. Yes, uh -huh. there's another there's another scheme that I love, which um, Cisco does, actually, the global technology company um, in the office. Uh, they realize that typically in companies, we don't really uh, acknowledge or value qualities like caring for each other. And um, and instead, typically valued nowadays are qualities like hyper competitiveness um, or determination at the expense of caring and being kind to each other. And Cisco actually has a scheme which rewards employees who are kind to each other. Basically, any employee up or down the company, whether it's um, the cleaner or the CEO, can nominate anyone else in the company for a cash reward of up to $10,000 if they've done something particularly kind or helpful. So from $100 to $10,000, um, which is a great scheme because it's you know, a way that the company's really clearly signaling you know, these qualities matter. And unsurprisingly, I, I argue, Cisco is, has much less turnover than other companies in the sector and also was voted um, for a couple of years running the best company in the world to work for. So, you know, another thing to think about, how do we reward qualities like kindness and caring for each other more explicitly in the workplace? Absolutely. I think we would all love to get paid for being nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I feel like we have, uh, we've outlined the problem very successfully, and I feel like I have a good scope of that, and we've started to get towards solutions, but I'd love to hear even more about solutions. So first, I know you have an improv group on Meetup, right? Um, how do you put all your research into practice when you're in that improv group? So, um, so I guess from my own experience with a group, and also from my research on what makes kind of groups feel more like communities, um, because that's the challenge, isn't it? How do you make a group feel like a community? Um, one thing I've found is that if you build it, they will come, but if they build it, they will stay. Mm. So how do you find ways for members of your group to actually contribute to the group itself, be kind of active, actually take responsibility for the group themselves, be active participants, not only in the um, activities itself, so, you know, in doing the improv, but other, other way, can people have other things they do? I mean, our group's small, so it's quite easy, you know, I'm responsible for collecting the money and Roderick is responsible for leading the class and Thierry is, is responsible for leading the tongue twisters and someone else, Amber is responsible for doing the warm up and everyone, but people have responsibilities, the key members and you know they can be small responsibilities, but it feels like we're all doing something and contributing something. And I think that's actually really important. Um, I think, also, what you know, this past year has been, of course, really challenging because um, we used to meet up physically, as I'm sure other people, everyone else um, on this call will, on this um, call will be identifying with. We used to meet up physically, and um, we had to migrate online. And you know, in some ways, it's been 
exciting and there have been new things that we were able to do thanks to technology that we weren't able to do before and using Zoom features like whiteboards and doing drawings and improvs off the back of drawings. So there've been kind of some fun technological things we've been able to do. Um, and there've been people who've been able to join our improv group from um, all over the world. We have um, one of our improvisers, you know, we've never met her. She's done this whole journey um, virtually now. So she joined the group when she was in London. Then she went to Peru, which is where she was from and was still coming to the group. And now she's gone to Paris uh, to do like a master's degree and she's still coming to the group. So, you know, that's wonderful. But, um, but some of our group stopped coming because for them, um, you know, the physical being together was really important. And I, I totally understand that. And I think the challenge as we come out of this, um, out of these periods of lockdown, I'm in London, you know, in the UK, we're still in very, very strict lockdown. We can't physically meet up. Um, I think the challenge will be, how do we not lose some of our new members who are our virtual members as we go back into the physical world? And that's something we've got to figure out. Like, do we do one week out of four, a virtual week so that we still have some connection? But I think the other thing about um, communities is I think it's this emphasis on you have to do things with others. And of course, that's, you know, that's very much what a lot of meetup is about, but it's about you know, doing things with others, not just, it's the difference between, you know, going to see a movie and having a passive experience or actively doing something. Cause it's through doing things with others that we experience this sense of what we might think of as collective effervescence, the joy of doing things in person with others. And that's you know, something that I'm excited to get back to when we're able to, for sure. Me too, me too. Um, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna get back to what you said towards the beginning where you mentioned that you uh, have other people in your group who help you lead. Uh, yes. we absolutely recommend that for anybody leading a group. Not only does it get them more invested, but it helps you too. You don't have to have all the responsibility to keep everything going on your shoulders. Um, I think that collective model works better for everybody involved. Yeah, definitely. I think also, you know, you've probably found this too, also acknowledging that there will be some people who don't want that and that's fine as well like you know there may be some people who always show up who will always be you know regular who are committed to the group but they don't want to have that kind of front of house role but then it's nice to try and think is there something they can do that works with their personality um that they can contribute as well yeah totally yeah and we all have things in our lives that we own and we keep going and then we have things that we just enjoy that other people own and keep going and I think that's a wonderful balance. Yes. Um, so I want to ask just some clear concrete ways can you recommend stuff that can make us feel less lonely what can we do? Yes well there's quite a lot that governments can do and my book goes into that in um, a lot of detail I won't go into kind of much that now unless people want to specifically ask about it with questions but one thing and this is striking across the world is that really ever since the 2008 financial crisis what we've seen across the globe is a steady underfunding or deinvesting of what we might in what we might think of as the infrastructure of community so public parks youth clubs community centers elderly daycare centers physical spaces where people can come together and be together. And one thing that, you know, I really think governments need to prioritize moving forward, li public, public libraries in the United States, public libraries have had a 40% reduction in federal um, budget since 2008. You know, but we, these places are essential for our communities and for anchoring our communities and for bringing different kinds of people together, which is really essential at these times when we're so fractured as societies. So reinvesting in the infrastructure of community, I put really high up there. And the other thing I put really high up there for governments right now is 
investing in um, really putting sufficient funds into addressing the very acute nature um, of loneliness right now off the back of a year of pandemic because levels are really at unprecedented highs. This is going to have a really, this, it's already having a really significant effect on the mental health um, of our populations. We're seeing real rises in mental health problems and this will play, will have an impact on physical health as well. So governments need to make significant commitments here. And we are seeing some governments already do that. Um, businesses, a lot that businesses can do. Um, we talked about, you know, just think as simple as encouraging employees to eat together. Um, when you when you're back in the office, um, I think it's really good. I think also, as companies navigate how to go back into the office, you know, there are some companies saying nobody ever needs to go back into the office. Uh, I actually think that's a mistake. I think people do want and it's good for the company to have at least some days a week physically in the office. And so big. And I actually think you know, ideally it's the same days a week that everyone's in the office. So, you know, even if it's three days a week, you're only in the office now, it should be the three, the same three days so that you can develop that social capital and those bonds with other employees. Um, but so much we can do ourselves too. Uh, we can try to put our phones down more and be more present with those physically around us. I mean, we've all been guilty of it, being in a room with our friends, our partners, our families, our heads in our phones, scrolling, not even hearing them. Uh, so it is really hard. They are so addictive. I try and I have a basket that I try and put my phone in in the evening so that it's actually out of arm's reach. Uh, somebody recently told me they have like a mini sleeping bag that they put their phone in so that they can't even see it. I like that. Um, and I try and take a digital Sabbath. So one day a week where I'm off, my, off digital completely so that I'm present with those around me. Um, another thing that we can do is an import, really important to do right now, especially, is really actively nurture our neighborhoods and our local communities. Um, as I was writing my book, I became increasingly aware that I wasn't doing that enough, that, you know, in my busy go, go, go life, you know, I wasn't stopping and exchanging a few words with the postman when I walked by him. I wasn't stopping and saying hello to my neighbours um, as I passed by them. I wasn't, you know, having a 30 second chat with the cashier in my local store, but actually those micro connections plays a huge part in making us feel more connected to each other. So really much more mindfully do that moving forward. And also really think, how can you help your local cafes, your local stores, your local um, bookstores, your local yoga studios right now? Because many of them are on their knees. And yet these places are so important to anchoring our neighborhoods. And we need them as much as they need us. So I think really being conscious of that too. And then um, maybe just a final thought is think about whether there's anyone right now in who you know in your network who might be feeling lonely. And if there is, reach out to them, pick up the phone, give them a call, even just send them a text. If you can meet up with them, do meet up with them in a socially distant, safe way, but just showing someone that you're thinking about them, that you care about them, that you see them can make a huge difference to how someone feels. Just a few thoughts there. That was great. I, I love the, the comprehensive set of answers and I'm going to try to put them into practice so much myself. Um, I know already I'm not the greatest about Remembering, remembering to reach out to people, but I'm trying to make it so that when I think about a friend, I say, oh, let me text them, let me reach out. Um, and that already has improved my life so much. So yeah, and I think, Josh, on that, just, it's like, if we put it on our to-do list, we probably don't do it. So it's almost like when you get the thought of the person, just even send a, hey, thinking of you. 
Mm -hmm. Huge difference. <laughs> the habits, the habits yeah. help so much. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's it for my questions, but we have a bunch of questions from the audience, if you don't mind answering some of them. I would love to. Uh, so the first one, I really love this one because it's so simple, but so crucial. So somebody anonymous asked, how do you define loneliness? Great question. Uh, so when I define loneliness, I'm not only talking about that feeling of craving connection um, with friends or family, um, that feeling of being disconnected from those we're meant to be closest to. I also define loneliness as feeling disconnected from our employer, from our government, from our workplace, from our fellow citizens. Um, I define loneliness as feeling invisible, feeling unseen, whether it is by those around us or whether it is by our workplace or the state. So for me, loneliness is personal, but it's also political, it's economic, and its drivers are um, various, economic, political, and technological, as well as to do with the way we treat each other and the way we choose to live our lives. Excellent definition. Um... Okay, let's let's ask this one. So, uh, Stephen asked, "Do you feel that one of the reasons people's families do not visit in nursing or residential homes is a fear of seeing your own loneliness reflected in this other person? And can a fear of being lonely actually lead you to take actions that make you more lonely?" That's another great question. Um, we are afraid of being lonely. In fact. And this really was um, brought home to me when in Germany, uh, there was research in Germany at the beginning of the pandemic with people phoning mental health helplines. And what the people answering the phones said they discovered was that m people were more afraid of being lonely than getting the coronavirus. So we are afraid of being lonely. And loneliness is um, something that's been really stigmatized in many ways. You know, it's like hard, it's been hard to talk about. And maybe one of the one of the positives that will come out of this past year is that we are talking about it more. You know, we've been through this year of collective enforced isolation, and we're all kind of admitting more, you know, yeah, I do feel lonely at times. Yes, it does feel isolating, and yes, it's hard. So um so I think it's important to kind of destigmatize it, but also in a way destigmatize it to ourselves so that it so that it doesn't become something where um, so it becomes something we think that we can talk about and actively address. And I think it's important to recognize, of course, that there is a difference between loneliness and choosing to be on your own and do things on your own, which is actually can be a very empowered choice. You know, I'm, I'm a writer, I spend a lot of my time on my own. I actually like being on my own. I like doing things on my own, um, but that's different to being lonely. So just kind of important to, um, to make that distinction. And that seems related to what you talked about earlier with the open floor plan, actually making people talk less because people didn't have that time to be by themselves and to recharge. Um, yes. That's super interesting. Yes. Um, okay, let's let's ask this one. Uh, Gerard asked, any advice on how to replace the water cooler talk that we used to have in the office or the eating lunch together time? Um, I'm presuming he's meaning now that we're doing this um, so, working, yeah. yeah, working virtually. So it's hard. There are no kind of silver bullets, but I can share a few things people have been sharing with me um, that they're saying is working. Uh, so one person told me about, I think it's called Lunch Club. It's like a, um, I don't know if it's just in the US, um, but it's basically a kind of virtual, almost matchmaking thing where you're matched with someone to eat your lunch with, um, literally. So um, someone with similar interests, I believe, to eat your lunch with. So there are things springing up, ways of kind of trying to create those 
uh, alone together moments. One company um, told me that they are doing a scheme where they've asked everyone in the company to post a photograph representing something they're interested in. So I don't know if you're into football, it might be a picture of Liverpool Football Club or um, English football, soccer, I was talking about that. Um, or if it's baking, it might be a photo of a cake or something. And then what they did was they matched up people across the company based on their interests. Uh, and one of the fascinating things about that was that people created bonds and started speaking to each other who actually would have never spoken to each other in the real workplace. Um, and wouldn't have even known that they had these shared passions or interests. So that's kind of quite a cool scheme. I think the other thing is um, it's really hard in big Zoom meetings to do that informal chit chat you would have done you know, when you were waiting for a meeting to start, when you just turn around to the person next to you and have a side conversation. So um, some people are doing kind of small group pre-meeting five minute breakouts so that you can try and have like more intimate conversations. And I think there is an issue about scale on Zoom for sure. And then I think there's the thing about, are we now in danger of defaulting um, to virtual interactions when actually sometimes we could be meeting people physically? Um, you know, maybe there's a colleague who actually does live near you and you could go and sit with them outside somewhere or in a safe space and actually see them face to face or go for a walk with them and do that meeting. Maybe there's a client who you could do that with as well. So, you know, I think we have to, and this is a general point, we have to be careful moving forward not to inadvertently trade off community for convenience. And that's something I think we have to be really mindful of in a world where contactless is being increasingly sold as an alternative to face-to-face -face contact, yeah. Lovely suggestions, thank you so much. Um, so I wanna ask this one from Sharon. She says, hi, Narina, do you have any tips for increasing connections when dealing with anxiety? I live in a great vibrant city in the UK, Brighton, but feel lonely and now anxious about getting out there and connecting with others, despite how much I want to do it. So it is hard if you're feeling anxious or lonely to you know, make, put yourself out there. And I totally understand that. And I totally appreciate that. Um, a couple of suggestions though on that front. Firstly, is there something you're really interested in? Uh, you know, maybe it's reading, maybe it's crafting, maybe it's doing improv, um, but you know, my gosh, I'm in the right place for, um, for where you can look, <laughs> you know, because there's bound to be something out there that speaks to you. So, you know, where people who've got an interest similar to yours are going to be congregating, and that's a really, really great place to start. I think the other thing, if you're feeling anxious or lonely yourself, think about, is there anyone you could help? Is there maybe some voluntary service you could do because helping others is actually a great way of feeling less lonely of feeling more connected to others and also of course helping yourself in the process so it's a, one of those real win 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 situations so just a couple of thoughts on that front but i appreciate it can be hard but you know i think the other thing is recognizing we're all feeling extra anxious extra stressed extra isolated right now. So you're really not alone in how you're feeling. It's almost incredible. I don't think there's been another time we can think of where we know that everybody is feeling anxious about getting back out there. So yeah, definitely not alone in that. Um, Laura as, is asking, how has loneliness impacted dating? <laughs> well, um, I have no firsthand experience of this having been uh, married for 10 years now um, but I have I'm watching my single friends and how they've um, how, how they are was was the question how the pandemic or how loneliness affects it 
how loneliness, but obviously they're they're interconnected, right? Um, yeah. so speak to whichever part of it you'd like to speak okay. to. Okay. Well, even before the pandemic, there was like a rise in loneliness and also a rise in, you know, corresponding again, you know, less people having sex, less people, less people touching, less cuddling, you know, ergo the paid cuddling, et cetera. So there was already that relationship. Um, in the pandemic, of course, you know, dating has been increasing, has been fraught and, um, you know, friends are definitely struggling with it. Some have probably not played by all the official rules and still been going on kind of um, dates, even at times when they weren't meant to be. And others have just really felt very lonely because you know, they haven't been able to do so. Depending on depending on how restrictive, of course, where your living is. So, um, but again, um, I think you know often you meet people when you're doing things with other people. And again, I'm speaking of somebody who you know really never lived through the internet dating because um, because I just had found someone before then, but you know in the old days. <laughs> You know, that's how you'd meet people. You'd meet people doing things with them. And then you'd see that you had similar interests or et cetera. And so again, um, you know, is there something to do with others where maybe you'll meet someone or maybe you'll meet just someone who's a, who becomes a friend and then maybe through that person, you'll meet a friend of theirs. But I guess I'm still for kind of those old, more old school face-to-face -face encounters. When I look at my friends and like look at their, tinder and hinge kind of apps it feels I'm, I'm just grateful that i'm not doing it because it just it feels like so commoditized and um and i'm sure you can get a much better sense of people by actually doing something with them and seeing them smile and seeing them laugh and seeing their eyes light up because they're interested in something Thank you. Thank you for answering all these questions. Um, I think that's going to have to be the last one because of time. But uh, before we go to a couple last slides here, I know uh, we've posted a link to get your book in the chat. So please, people check that out. But can you just tell us a little more about your book and where we can get sure. it? Sure. So my book is called The Lonely Century. Um, it is current. It, we have such a global audience here. So it's currently out in the UK. US, Australia, New Zealand, um, Norway, Sweden, Taiwan, no, not Sweden yet, coming out in Sweden soon, Norway, Netherlands, um, South Korea, just come out in Germany where it's just hit the bestseller list um, this week, which is exciting, um, and available from all good independent bookstores, um, but also, of course, from e retailers as well from big bookstores um, and from e-retailers as well um, the lonely century I do hope you read it and if you do you know you know do drop me a line and tell me what you think I'd really appreciate it okay so once again link to that is in the chat please check it out everybody we also will be hosting an Instagram giveaway tomorrow at 9 a.m eastern standard time uh, we're going to have two lucky winners who will win a free copy of the book so check that out on Meetup's Instagram. That's where that's going to be. Um, so can we get the slides back up for whoever is controlling that right now? Uh, there we go. Okay, um, so we talked a lot about loneliness today and uh, Meetup loves to do our best we can to address that as well. So if you have, if you wanna find people who have similar interests to you, please uh, start a group on Meetup. We're giving you 50% off your first organizer subscription if you go to meetupsavings.com. Um, we'd love to have you. And the other thing I wanna talk about is our podcast called Keep Connected. It's with Meetup CEO, David Siegel. Um, so you can actually take out your phone if you're into podcasts and scan this QR code. It'll take you right to the podcast to listen. Um, and that is pretty much it for today. I just want to remind everybody, if you missed maybe the start of the event, we're going to have a recap and a recording on our Community Matters blog. That's at meetup.com slash blog. Um, so check that out. That'll probably be up in about a day or two. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Norena. It was really lovely talking to you today. Um, and everybody, be safe and take care.
Thank you. Bye, everybody.